Okay. So, yesterday, remember we looked at God back in eternity, and God has uh, a glorious plan. And uh, we actually do a series of studies on all of the things that God planned from before the foundation of the world. And, and you can kind of start looking those things up yourself by going into your, if you have, um, what do they call that, e-sword, um, and you can go and I'll put in something there like uh, before creation or before time began or something and find all the relevant verses and you can find all of the things that God planned from before the foundation um, of the world, including the cross. Um, and that Jesus would be chosen to be the Lamb of God, all before the foundations of the world. And that you and I, that mankind would be transformed into the image of Christ. All of that was predetermined before the foundations of the world. Then God created. And when God created the heavens and the earth and... Satan, when he rebelled and became the serpent, so I put the head on him down here, this now actually was the beginning of time. Because before there was sin, there was no time. There was only eternity. So sin is like an interruption in eternity. It's a little blip that's, that's come on the map, which is... Because God knew this was going to happen. He knew that Satan was going to rebel. He knew that Adam was going to fall into sin. And some people say to me, well, if that's the case, why did God create Satan or Lucifer? Why did he create man if he knew man was going to sin? Well, God saw the end result. And he saw that the process, as painful as it was, even for himself, that the father would give his son... And the Holy Spirit would empower the Son to die and suffer on the cross for all of the sins, sicknesses, rebellions of mankind. But God saw the end result and said it's worth it. The pain is worth it. And so God entered into a process. But you see, he had made plans before this happened. He planned for the cross before this happened. He planned for the elimination and extermination of sin for all of eternity. You see, salvation is not restoring us back to like it was in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were little babes, even though they were created with mature bodies. But they had no experience of relationship with God. And God did not want a humanity that still had the possibility of sin. So salvation isn't just redeeming us from sin, but it is also exterminating the possibility of there ever being sin again. And because of that, we were going to have to be changed and transformed into the image of Christ, that the divine nature of Christ would be infused within us, that it would become impossible for there ever to be sin again. And that's why eternity is safe. That's why heaven is safe. I mean, if it wasn't for that, what would stop somebody in heaven one day saying, no, I'm not going to do that anymore? Then all of a sudden, do we have to go through the whole process again? No, because in God's plan, not only was he bringing salvation from sin, but exterminating the possibility of there ever being a fall again. And that's what makes our salvation secure. Anyway, so Satan rebelled and time began. You could say this bubble, which we call the heavens and the earth that were created in Genesis uh, verse 1, began a process. And last night we saw how in this process, first by the fall of Satan, second by the fall of Adam. So we had a first week, which was creation, and a second week, which is redemption. 
factors. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we've got two seventh days. Uh, one, two, three, four, there's the cross. And we're now living down here. At the end of the sixth day. Here, when or Christ returns, here the second coming of Christ, and at the end of the seventh day, we have the illumination of the old heavens and the old earth. We get a new heavens and a new earth. And now we're back to eternity with God plus us. And time shall be no more. A new heavens, a new earth, uh, the new Jerusalem. And being with him forever and ever in the fullness of his glory, of his righteousness, of his joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. Uh, you know, joy unspeakable and full of, full of glory is something I think we could all have a dose of. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome what God has, has planned. So in session two, we're looking at God's plan for a glorious finale. Now, Annette's going to talk about uh, a few other things and aspects that I uh, won't touch upon, I guess. Um, but we'll find out what, uh, what she's got in store for us a little bit later on. Okay, let's go to the next diagram. Here we have, we looked at uh, last night, the time begins for man. So we're looking at the second, the second week over here. Time uh, began for man with the fall of Adam. Uh, you know, before Adam sinned, he had no age. He had, there was no death in him. Uh, aging is actually the dying process. You start dying the moment you're born. The cells in your body begin decaying, even though it looks like it's growing and becoming more healthy. But, but actually the decay process has become. And aging is the process of measuring your death. Uh, because when we come into eternity, there's no more aging. You don't get older. Uh, in fact, Thank God that there's also, uh, we get glorious resurrection bodies. Um, so, you know, no more false teeth, no more glasses. Uh, we all get our, our full hair back. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, pretty awesome. So we saw last night how from the ancients that they had this scenario in various forms um, of the ages for the 6,000 years and the seventh uh, final uh, thousand years, uh, which the Jews saw it a little bit differently because they didn't uh, have the, the full of the fullness of the New Testament to give that full, uh, full picture. And in that 6,000 years from Adam until the second coming of Christ, we have time divided into three ages or three eras. The age of the Father, the age of the Son, the age of the Holy Spirit. And we saw that there were signposts. Uh, in the first 2,000 years, you got from Adam, the father of all humanity, Noah, the father of all humanity, down to Abraham, the father of all who believe. In the second age, we saw that there are two only begotten sons, the only two in the whole Bible. Isaac, who was prophetic of Christ, uh, and Jesus himself, the only begotten sons of Abraham and, and the Father. And the age of the Holy Spirit began with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on 120 in the upper room and will conclude at the 120th Jubilee, which 120 by 50, do the maths, 6,000 years. So it brings us down to the end of that time. Then the return of Christ and the seventh day being the, the 1,000 years of the rule and reign of Christ. Um, it's interesting also that we see that uh, in uh, 1 John 5, 7, 8, those verses there, it says there's three signs on the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And we see that in those three ages, the, we had the sign of the water in the first 2000. The world was baptized uh, in water in the days of Noah. Um, the only people who came out were the eight in the, eight in the ark. The next 2,000 years, well, you could say the world was baptised in blood. 
It was the age where hundreds of millions of animal sacrifices and the blood flowed and flowed and flowed until Jesus says it's finished on the cross. And he was the one final sacrifice for sin. And of course, since the start of the third age, the age of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was outpoured and uh, the prophecies were that the Holy, Holy Spirit would be poured out upon all flesh in the end time. So, and that brings us down to the 120th Jubilee. Now, moving on to the next diagram, this just brings us now to the last, uh, say, 3,000 years from 30 AD when Christ was crucified, the age um, of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the seventh day uh, millennium. And there in 2021, that's where we are today, uh, you know, getting down towards uh, the end. Uh, then you've got that little uh, green uh, um, line, the perfection of the church. This is the ultimate goal. When uh, Christ will be fully manifest within uh, his church. Then after that, we have the final three and a half years, which is often referred to as the Great Tribulation, sometimes referred to as the wrath of God when the Antichrist will reign for three and a half years. Now, Revelation 11, Revelation 12 and 13, we'll touch uh, on those uh, shortly. But Revelation 11 deals with the two witnesses of Christ who are going to be pouring judgment on the face of the earth for three and a half years. Then Revelation 12 tells us of a glorious woman who is going to give birth to a child uh, and then she will flee into the wilderness for three and a half years. And then in chapter 13, the Antichrist ruling for three and a half years. So they're all talking about the same three and a half year period of time. So we're on our way and getting closer and closer to that period um, of time. Now, just coming up a little bit closer. Um, in these end times, we've got the uh, next one. Thanks. Uh, the perfection of the church, well, let's go back 2021, that's today. Uh, that's where we are. And we're now in this period of restoration. And we'll look at some verses on that in a moment. Uh, and that will bring us up to the perfection of the church. Then we have the final ingathering. And we'll talk about that, give some verses on that. Then that final three and a half years. Uh, and at the end of that three and a half years, the second coming um, of Christ. We'll also touch on the question of the rapture um, because a lot of people are looking for a rapture to get out of here. Um, but it's not going to happen quite like that. Okay, now let's move on to the next thing, the, f the end time restoration. Okay, so going back to that diagram for a minute, you can see the, we're in the time of restoration. This is the first thing we're wanting to look at today. So between now and before the Great Tribulation, the church will have fulfilled God's plan and purpose for the church. The final great revival will have happened. Uh, the church will have been changed and transformed into the image of Christ. Uh, and only when the church has fulfilled its mission, then the church is going to be taken out of the way. And that must happen before the Antichrist can be revealed. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says the Antichrist cannot be revealed until that which holds him back is taken out of the way. Now, some people think, oh, maybe that's uh, the rapture. Some people think, well, maybe that's the Holy Spirit being taken out of the way. But you can't take the Holy Spirit out of the way because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Um, but we will look, well, we won't look specifically at that. It's probably a verse I could have looked at. Maybe even Anna can look at it. Uh, the, the church being taken out of the way because it's the church that's holding Satan back. We are the salt of the earth. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. I mean, he is the salt of the earth, but he said, you are the salt of the earth. And salt is a preservative. Salt holds back the decaying process. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its flavor, it's good for nothing. And so if a church or Christians have lost that saltiness of the love of Christ, then they become good for nothing Christians. 
Now, I actually went to a, a salt factory because I wanted to know what saltless salt was. Because if a salt is lost, it's savour. How, if, it hasn't, if it's not salty, how can it be salt? And they laughed at me as though I was stupid. Well, on that, I was stupid. I didn't, I didn't know. It turns out that adding certain chemicals to salt eliminates that saltiness. And then that material is used to make glass. Glass is made from salt. Now, you wouldn't get a glass and smash it up into little fine particles and sprinkle it on your, uh, on your fried rice. You know, it's, go it's, it's good for nothing. Just to be it says, thrown out and trampled underfoot. I wouldn't trample underfoot unless you had good solid boots on. But in other words, that which is holding back the power of Satan in the last days is the church and that's why the church is under attack he wants to destroy the church because the church is holding him back he wants to take over but he can't at the moment and the restoration that's taking place now that will be preparing the church to reach its full potential in Christ and the final in gathering that will bring that great final harvest and when that job is finished the church will be taken out of the way. Not up, but out. We'll look at that in a minute. Because the rapture doesn't take place until the end of the three and a half year great tribulation. I know many churches, many Bible scholars will talk about the rapture at the start of the great tribulation. But I just want to say that there's no biblical justification for that view. It's a wonderful theory uh, taught by Hal Lindsey in the late great planet Earth. And also in the Left Behind um, series, as you know, we're all going to get raptured out of here. We're going to float around in the clouds for seven years or something like that. Um, anyway, but uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And you may have some questions on that, that subject. But I'm just giving you an alternate view. And you can weigh it up for yourself. Okay, the end time restoration. In Acts chapter 3, 19 to 21... Here we have uh, a message about the second coming of Christ. And the warning is given to us, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. Now notice this next phrase. Whom heaven must receive. That word receive there is hold back. Uh, and heaven must receive, must hold back until the times of restoration of all things. In other words, Jesus is not coming back tonight. Not unless it's a personal coming for you because your time's up and he's come to pick you up and take you home. I mean, that can happen to anyone at any time. But when it comes to the second coming of Christ, the heavens must hold him back until the time of the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And there are so many prophetic statements that the Bible has given that have not yet been fulfilled. I mean, one very uh, easy to observe one is Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached throughout the whole world to all nations. That word nations is ethne, ethnic groups. And then the end will come. So until such time as the Great Commission has been 100% fulfilled, Christ must remain in the heavens. And that hasn't happened yet. I mean, even in Indonesia, there's still lots of groups of people that have never heard the gospel. Throughout the Middle East, many that have never heard the gospel. Many other parts of the world in Africa haven't heard um, the gospel. Now, we may be getting very close, you know, with all of the different uh, societies that have taken missionaries, translated Bibles into local languages, missionaries that have gone and lost their lives with uh, television, internet and radio. Uh, you know, more and more people are being reached with the gospel. We are getting close to that time. But we still haven't got there. So it talks about uh, the restoration of all things. In Joel 2.25, I will restore to you 
Now in Joel, reading through John, uh, through Joel, we, we read how God was bringing judgment against his people because of their disobedience, unbelief. And so he sent his army of judgment, which was foreign nations, that would come to punish them. But then the Lord was talking about their repentance and restoration. And he said, and I will restore to you the years that were all eaten away. And you know, there are some people who may be in their younger years. They were fully committed and sold out for Christ. But then things happened. Uh, battles, bitternesses, problems. And you kind of go a little bit cool, lukewarm. Then as you start to age on a little bit, you realise, gee, I'm, I'm closer to the end than I was to the beginning. Um, and I better start getting things right. In it. But then, the, then Satan wants to whisper, you're good for nothing. You're a failure. But the promise of God is, I will restore to you the years that were eaten up. See, the last, our last years can be our best years. You see, when we, in full repentance and faith in Christ, his promise is, I will restore to you everything that was taken away from you. I'm going to restore it. See, God's not in the business of saying, so many years you served me, then so many years you did not. So I'm only going to restore to you this little bit. No, he's going to restore everything. So this is the greatness of the grace of God, that when we return to him, and this is a promise, you could say, that relates to the last day church. I'm going to restore to you all of the things that were devoured. Now, let's have a look at this chart here on the decline of the church. See, the church experienced that decline, that falling away. See, here you can see on this uh, diagram here, Back in 30 AD was the cross, 64 AD Paul was killed, 65 AD Peter was killed, 100 AD John died, bringing to the end of what's called the apostolic period um, of the church. But the golden age of the church was really only the first 30 to 35 years after the cross, up until the time of Paul and Peter uh, being killed. We read at the end of uh, Paul's ministry, he writes uh, to Timothy and, and says, all Asia has left me. And, it, and people get listed and said, they had the love of the world and they, they, they no longer followed Christ. So the early church experienced a decline. Before you get to the time um, of John passing away at the end of the century, there was a church that was in trouble. And even John, in uh, the third epistle of John, had to face a coup d'etat in a church just outside of Ephesus that was led by three elders. There was Diotrephes, Gaius and Demetrius. But uh, Diotrephes, he overthrew the other two, took over the church. Maybe he thought that when he preached, the tithes were up and the others preached, the tithes went down or something. I don't know what it was, but it says that he loved to have the preeminence. The Apostle John had sent uh, some uh, ministries in to uh, have a look at this situation, but Diotrephes would not accept them. You can read that in 3 John verses uh, 9 and 10. And it says, anybody who accepted the ones that John had sent in, he cast them out of the church. So he was, this was the new order of things that, of the church in decline, rejecting the biblical models of uh, leadership and of ministry within the church and even the function of the members of the church. So on the left-hand side there, the church left eldership, biblical eldership that is, the fivefold ministries. In fact, the fivefold ministries ended up being replaced with the five uh, Catholic uh, ministries of the Pope, uh, cardinals, archbishop, bishops and priests, uh, which replace apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Um, uh, they left speaking in tongues as an evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The new song, praise and worship, uh, where the Holy Spirit would, would, would move through a congregation in praise and worship and song. 
They left the royal priesthood where every person was a king and a priest under God. They left the authority of the Bible. See, what was happening, because the church began to practice the priestly tribe instead of uh, an every member uh, of the body, a hierarchy of the papal system, infant baptism replacing believers' baptism, uh, sacramental system, that unless you followed the seven sacraments um, of the church, you weren't going to be saved, salvation by works, letters of indulgence, that if you wanted forgiveness, you're going to have to, uh, to pay for it, um, and that the authority of the church replaced the authority of the Bible. This was the decline of the church. But then the restoration in the church began. Let's say from the time of Martin Luther. And in 1517, uh, a tremendous change took place called the Reformation. I mean, there were others who inspired Martin Luther, like John Wycliffe, who inspired John Hus, who inspired Martin Luther. But Martin Luther was the one who brought about the breakthrough. 1521, believers' baptism began to be restored. In the 1700s, we have the holiness uh, movements. The 1800s, the New Testament church and, and, and the Great Commission movements uh, began. Uh, in the 1900s, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in 1948, the Lateran revival began to take place. The 1960s, restoration of gifts of the Holy Spirit in the charismatic movement. In the 1980s, apostolic and uh, prophetic movements began to uh, rise up. And the restoration continues. And here we are in 2021, and we're getting close to the end when God is going to bring about the fullness of the restoration of all things at the end of that sixth day. So I mean, we look at history, and history just confirms what, what the Bible had uh, declared to us. Now, in Revelation 4 and verse 1, which follows, of course, Revelation 1, 2, and 3, which is the church leaving the truth and the foundations. In Revelation 1, 2, and 3, we see that the church is now infiltrated by the spirit of Balaam and the spirit of uh, Jezebel, uh, the spirit of uh, the Nicolaitans and uh, all kinds. Of, and the church has left its first love. And in fact, they've even left Jesus. Because what do we get in the seventh of those, those churches what we get Jesus is outside and he wants to come in you see Jesus has been locked out of his own church and the Laodiceans in the end of Revelation 3 they said we have need of nothing well they did have a need they needed Jesus uh, and that's what's happened with a lot of churches today. Jesus is locked out. But thank God we've got the promise of restoration. So Revelation 4, 1, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. See, the access to heavenly revelation has not finished that's why we had that pathway of restoration that we just looked at from Martin Luther onwards and the restoration of all things will come to pass in these last days to me this is a much more important truth for us to understand than is 666 the chip uh, we, because that's going to come afterwards What's the most important thing in the last days is what God wants to bring to pass and fulfill in you and me as the church. See, we're the central part. I mean, the very first thing that God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit spoke, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, the first mentioned principle in hermeneutics is that the first mentioned things are the most important that reveal a chain um, of revelation. And here's John at the end of chapter 3, start of chapter 4, and he's probably a little bit depressed, you know, seeing what's happening in all these other churches. You have left your first love. Uh, you know, you're infiltrated by the adulterous spirit of Jezebel. Uh, you know, you've got this... Uh, dictatorial Nicolaitan structure that's, uh, that's come in. 
Laodicea, you're so lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I mean, that's how bad the church was. And after these things, I looked and saw a door standing open in heaven. Access to heavenly revelation and understanding. And I heard the voice of a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here. And I will show you things which, which what? Which hopefully will take place? No. Which must take place. Here is Jesus making his declaration. Now, he's the Lord of the church. He's the head of the church. And he's telling John, I want you to have a look at the church of the future. Now, we haven't got time to have a look at all of that, but... In Revelation 4 and 5, this diagram just gives a little bit of an illustration of what John was seeing in Revelation 4 and 5. He saw a Christ-centred church. He saw Jesus in the midst of the church. He saw the seven spirits of God, speaking of the, the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit, the perfect working of the Spirit of God uh, in the church. He saw a church filled with prayer and worship. They were singing a new song. He saw they had 24 elders, a multiple leadership, leading and guiding uh, the church into uh, the events that were to come. He saw the church as a royal priesthood, kings and priests under God. He saw there was unity, one body. You know, I mean, if, if, if Jesus was to send a letter to the, to the church in Portland, who would pick it up from the post office? You know, back in Bible days, in a city, there was one church. Uh, they might have met in many different locations, like in the Romans, in Romans 16, we, read, we, we see they, they met in many different uh, locations, but they didn't write to the churches of Rome, it was the church of Rome. They might have met in many different locations, but they were one body of Christ. Total evangelism. In Revelation 4 and 5, we read there, it says that these people have gathered out of every tribe, kindred, nation and tongue. In other words, the Great Commission fulfilled. Every tribe, kindred, nation and tongue was there. And then the seven seals of the mysteries of God in the last days uh, were being opened up. This is the vision that John was given. Not the sort of mess at the seven churches, what man had made, the mess that man had made of the church. Because God has promised he's going to restore all things. And he's wanting people who've got a heart and a vision for restoration. Now, let's come down a little bit further. In Revelation 11, as this vision has been shown to John, this is just before we see the two witnesses unveiled. He says, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And when you study the measuring rod in the Bible, I'm just looking for something I can use as a measuring rod. Rod doesn't seem to be any long stick of something that I can, I can use. I, I found something. Okay, here is my measuring rod. The measuring rod in the Bible is Christ. We are called to measure up to him. We don't measure ourselves with ourselves. That's carnality. But there is a measuring rod that comes into the temple. And don't you know that you are the temple of the living God? And the measuring rod will be brought up. Does this person measure up? Does this person measure up? Does this person measure up to the fullness of Christ? He's the measuring stick. I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angels stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside. Now, let me take a blue. The, the temple or the tabernacle was divided into three main sections. You had the outer court, which is here. You had the the altar of sacrifice where the blood was, was shed. You had the brazen laver where they then had to wash. So you got being born by the blood of the lamb and, been, and water baptism. 
Then they came into the holy place. We had the seven branch candlestick. That was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Then you had the table of showbread with 12 loaves of bread on it, the apostolic doctrine and foundations of the church. Then you come down to the brazen uh, altar, where this is the altar of incense, where praise and worship. And then in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant with the Shekinah glory um, of God. So it says here, measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. So the key part of the measuring is here. You could say this is worshipping in spirit and in truth. Jesus said the time is now coming and now is when true believers must worship the Father. So there's the worship in spirit and in truth. So the church, born again, water baptised, filled with the Holy Spirit, growing in the word of God and fulfilling and becoming the burning coals on the altar of incense, which on one day of the year, the high priest would pick up and take beyond the veil into the most holy place. So that the most holy place was filled with the cloud of, of praise and worship. So in Revelation 11, it says, measure those who are here, because these are the ones that are going to be taken into the most holy place. It's like the five wise virgins. They had the oil. And so they were able to go into the, the wedding feast. But the others, like it says here, leave out the court which is outside the temple, is the outer court. Like the five foolish virgins, they'd run out of oil and they had to go out to look for it. And then the bridegroom came. So they weren't ready. It says, leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months, or three and a half years. So you've got the church, some that are going on up to the measure, and they're going into the fullness of God's presence, but you have some of the church that had to come out, and they will end up going through that three and a half years of great tribulation where it says they will be beheaded uh, for their faith uh, in Christ. So the church is going to, you know, not everybody's an overcomer. That's why seven times it says in Revelation uh, 2 and 3, to him that overcomes, I will give this. Seven times, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. God in the last days is wanting an overcoming church. But unfortunately, not every Christian, not every believer is prepared to pay the price. They don't want to take up the cross. They don't want to fully obey. You know, they say, oh, look, don't get too fanatic about your faith. The important thing is you make it to heaven, even, even if you're in the, in, 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 in the far corner. As long as you get in, well, just be make sure that you do get in. But God doesn't want us to be ones who go into that period of great tribulation where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth, the Bible says. He wants us to be overcomers. Ah, then in Revelation 11, 3, and I will give power to my two witnesses. You see, the church has gone out. They've gone into that most holy place. And I will give power to my two witnesses. Now these two witnesses, it's a tremendous study in the Bible, but a witness has to be someone who has seen or heard directly. Now you may have heard a lot of people say that, oh, the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Well, I think they are. And I think that they make amazing appearances through the ministry of Jesus. Like when Jesus was born, there were three wise men who knew that Jesus was God. Because it says they bowed down and they worshipped him. And the three gifts that were brought were all prophetic of Christ's life, death, his ministry. I happen to think that it was Moses, Elijah and Enoch. But 
Don't trust your salvation to that. That's, that's just my view. Then a little bit later on, when Jesus goes through the temptation, it says an angel. The word angel just means messengers. Heavenly messengers who came and ministered and strengthened Christ at the end of his 40 days of fasting. Then he goes to the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James and John go up with him. And who do they see there? Matthew 17. Moses and Elijah are talking with Jesus. And the face of Jesus shone with the glory of the sun. And they spoke with Christ and strengthened him for his ministry. At the grave, when Jesus was crucified, there were two men in white apparel who stood at either or sat at either end of where they had laid the body of Jesus. Who were these two men in white apparel? And then in Acts 2, when Jesus ascends to heaven, there are two men in white apparel who talk to the, uh, to the apostles and say to them, Why are you looking up? The same Jesus is coming back again. And then in Revelation 11, we have the two witnesses of, of Jesus, one who turns water into blood and the other one who stops it raining for three and a half years. Well, Moses and Elijah. But I'll throw that one in for free. Just have a think about that one. But he's two, these two witnesses, and they're going to prophesy for this three and a half years, 1,260 days. Now, this is during the period when the overcomers have gone into the divine protection of God. It's just like the children of Israel in the land of Goshen. When the judgments of God were coming down on Egypt, God protected his people in Goshen. They didn't have to go through those ten plagues. Then coming down to Revelation 12, we now have this glorious woman. The Catholic Church say it's Mary. Some churches have speculated it might be Israel. But this is the age of the church, at the end of the church age. And this woman, glorious woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. And she gives birth to a man-child. This is what makes some people think, oh, it must have been Mary giving birth to Jesus. But we'll find that there's three man-childs in the Bible. But in Revelation 12, Then being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The birth of this child is going to cause... Uh, an enormous event. Now, I said there's three man-childs. The first one was Moses, the deliverer. Satan wanted to kill him, so he killed all the male children but failed through his servant uh, Pharaoh. He tried to get Jesus 2,000 years ago. He failed there too because even though he had Herod as his servant, but uh, he killed all the children out of two except for the deliverer. He got away. And in the last days, Satan comes to the birth and he wants to kill this child. But this child is different. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and devour her child. Now, it has a capital C in the English translation because the translators uh, probably thought it was Jesus. In the Greek, it's not a capital C. It's just a small C, just like everything else. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, the Bible gives us three who are going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Jesus is one of them who's mentioned he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. Secondly is the overcoming church in Revelation chapter 2. It says, and they will rule all nations with a rod of iron. And the third one is this child who is the product um, of Christ and the church. And notice what happens to this child. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Well, when Mary gave birth to Jesus, Jesus was not immediately taken up to heaven and protected in heaven. They went out. The Greek word is paralambano. They went out on an exodus, on a horizontal journey to Egypt. 
Mary didn't go out on her own one way and Jesus snatched up to heaven. Because Revelation 12 is, is talking about uh, this particular event. It's not the birth of Jesus. It can't be. The timing's wrong. It's in the last three and a half years of time. Jesus was born 2,000 years ago and he went out to Egypt uh, with his um, uh, mother and father, with Joseph and Mary. So the three man childs, you've got Moses, Jesus and this offspring nation. This last man child is a nation. Isaiah 66, 6 to 8 prophesies this event. The sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple. Who's the temple? You and I are the temple. We're the city of God. We're the temple of God. And the voice of the Lord, who fully repays his enemies. Before she was in labour, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labour, she gave birth to her children. And I believe this is prophetic of the great end time revival that's going to take place. As the church has been changed and transformed and experienced the restoration of all things, we're going to see the greatest outpouring of the Spirit of God, the greatest revival that history has, has ever seen. And this is what's going to precipitate the church being taken out of the way. The revival, the harvest is over. And now the Antichrist is released and is able to rise to power for that last three and a half years. Now, the first overcomer Exodus was, of course, Israel in the Old Testament, the people of God in the Old Testament. And in Exodus 19, verse 4, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings. Eagles' wings in the Bible is the power of the Holy Spirit. They that wait on the Lord will mount up with wings as eagles. I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, the children of Israel went out on eagles' wings, but they walked. They weren't flying. I like Philip's transportation. I wish it was Philip's transportation, but they walked. But it says their shoes never wore out. God gave them supernatural speed and protection. The power of the Holy Spirit, eagle's wings, is the power of the Holy Spirit taking God's people to where God wants them to be. Now, they were protected in Goshen from the plagues um, of judgment, but God brought Israel out on eagle wing power. The woman in Revelation 12, this is the end of the journey. That was the start of the journey. Now the end of the journey, Revelation 12, 14. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, or the three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. She's on the earth, not, not floating around in the skies, ducking 747s, you know. Uh, no, she's, she's here on the earth. Because, no, no, the, well, we'll look at that in a minute. This gives a bit of a diagram 30 AD, age of the Holy Spirit, we're in 2021. And we're coming up towards that time of the full restoration. At the end of that restoration and the revival that takes place, we will have the exodus of the church. The church will be taken out on the wings of eagles by the power of the Holy Spirit, but still on the earth, not up in the sky. The rapture will take place at the end of that three and a half years. Now, let's have a look at a couple of more verses. Psalm 91, 4 to 8. Here's another prophecy of what's going to happen in the judgments at the end times. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings, these eagles' wings. You will take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the missiles <laughs> that fly by night, nor of the pestilence of the pandemics that walk in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand but it shall not come near you only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked as god is pouring out his judgment through the two witnesses 
and the judgments are being poured out on the, on the face of the earth, the church will be in protection on the earth. Just like Goshen was, or Israel in Goshen, under the protection of God. Notice 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. This is where it talks about the rapture. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, not three and a half years before the coming of the Lord or seven years before the coming of the Lord, they will be alive and remain uh, until the coming of the Lord, the parousia of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Then the dead in Christ will rise first. Who will rise first? The dead in Christ. Now, we already mentioned how part of the church, those who are not the overcomers, they go into that great tribulation period. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 13 and uh, down to 20 that they're going to be beheaded for their faith in Christ because they refuse to bow down and worship the beast or receive the mark and the number of the beast. So these are the dead in Christ, the last group of the dead in Christ. And this verse is telling us, will by no means proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain. Remain in where? I just told you. you know, we were taken out into the place of God's protection on the earth. I mean, if we're raptured before them, we're violating... Uh, what the scripture is telling us here. Then we who are alive and shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So it has to be at the end, not at the beginning. It has to be after the last Christian has been killed because the dead in Christ must rise first. Okay, next diagram, we see this, okay? The age of the Holy Spirit, the exodus of the church in Revelation 12. But the rapture comes at the end there. And when the rapture takes place at the last trump when Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and they who are raised from the dead will all be changed and transformed. Resurrection bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 41 to 42. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. Remember that woman? She's got a crown of 12 stars, clothed in the sun, the moon under her feet. And this woman, and here's the church, one glory of the sun, the moon, the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. This is the glory of God on his church. Verses 51 to 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And his mortal must put on immortality. So those who are alive and remain... The dead in Christ rise first, then together with them we are changed and transformed and we get these glorious bodies and that's why we're not going to get dissolved in the glory of God at the second coming of Christ. Because when he returns in glory and it says, as blazing fire, it won't bother us because we'll have resurrection bodies. The dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive, we're all changed and transformed in the twinkling of an eye. And then we're caught up to meet Christ. And, and it says when we get, meet Christ in the air. The Indonesian word uses the word menyongsong, which means to greet. And actually that's what the Greek means. We don't go to hang around 
up in the clouds for years. We meet him. We're the welcoming committee. And then we return together with him. And in the blazing glory and judgment coming down upon Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all unbelievers, and the judgments of God being poured out in the battle of Armageddon, the only reason we can survive is because we've got those glorious resurrection bodies. Nobody else can survive that glory. But before we get to his second coming, we got to the end of this period of restoration. And now we have a glorious church that will bring about the last and final great revival, which includes that man-child that I was talking about. That's what Satan wants to stop. He doesn't want to see nations coming into the kingdom of God. But the church, fully restored, will be filled with God's glory and it will be visible. Isaiah 60, 1-2. Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. I mean, you know, at the moment, a lot of people think this is what's happening. Darkness covering the earth, deep darkness the people. So much depression and fear because of COVID. Look, this is nothing compared to what's coming. And that's why we as the people of God need to be walking in biblical restoration, being changed and transformed into the image of Christ. And here we see that rise, shine, the light has come, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. It says, and the Lord will rise over you and his glory will be what? His glory will be seen. It's not going to be a secret revelation of his glory. And yesterday I said, if we're going to change cities and nations, we're going to have to have signs and wonders. And the greatest sign is what God's going to do in the church. The world thinks we're done for. You know, it, we, we will soon disappear. But they're going to be in for a big surprise because actually we're, we're like little eggs. And... Uh, and we're like the little chicken on the inside and, and the Holy Spirit is, is sitting on us. And inside it's developing and changed. We're being changed. And there's a hatching day coming. And we're going to break out of those shells and there's going to be a manifestation of God's glory uh, on the church. The glory will be seen in you. Verse 3 and 4. The Gentiles shall come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather. They come to you. At the moment, they won't have anything to do with you. But the power and the glory of God in the church in the last days is going to be the greatest sign and the greatest wonder fulfilling the prayer of Jesus. And it's going to shake the nations. And God said, I'm going to shake heaven and earth. So that my house might be filled with glory. You know, we're not singing the song, Hold the Fort for He is Coming. We're believing in a triumphant second coming of Christ, end time uh, victory. Revelation 5, 9 to 11 tells us about this great revival. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. You know, the angels sing, one soul gets saved. What's going to happen when nations are getting saved? You know, and around the throne they're singing and praising the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Revelation 7, 9, and after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. It's going to be a great glorious end. It's not going to be defeatism. It's going to be a triumphant, glorious end. Romans 8, 19, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing. I, I like to call this the hatching day of the sons of God. 
in the end times, victorious believers will grow and be revealed in the image of Christ. Like a hen sitting on her eggs, they all hatch the same day. You know, she lays her egg one day, 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 but hatching days all together. You know, and we might have got born again one day, one day, one day, one day, but hatching day is going to be together. It's not, you know, one pops open and then a couple of days later, now it's all going to be together. And that's when we're going to see the fulfillment of John 14, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Because they go to my Father. What did Jesus promise the church? You're going to do what he did. He walked on water. You done that lately? He went to the grave of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth. Have you done that lately? Yeah. Jesus took five loaves and two fishes and he fed 5,000. Jesus said, what I do, you're going to do. You done that lately? And greater than this. I mean, we could look at that and say that's impossible. Well, as I said yesterday, Jesus is a specialist in impossibilities. And he's the one that said this. This is what you're going to do. But if we're going to do that, we have to be like him. We have to have been changed and transformed. This restoration in the last days. John, Jesus prayed in John 17, 20 to 21. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe. See, this is why when some people say, oh, no, 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 it's impossible. It can't happen. In heaven, we'll be like Jesus. Well, why can't Jesus do it here? Are you saying that Jesus is more powerful up there than he is down here? Are you saying that the power of the cross is not fully powerful here, but only up in heaven? See, when Jesus said it's finished, the whole work of our redemption, salvation, transformation to be the people that God wants us to be was fully complete in the power of the cross. And that's what he's calling us to believe. And he's praying that we might have this sort of experience that the world may believe. The greatest sign and wonder in these last days. You know, when Jesus was crucified, in Hebrews 10, 10 to 14, it says this very well. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standing ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. What a frustrating experience those old priests had. For 1,500 years, they offered sacrifices in the tabernacle and the temple. Every day, every week, every month, every year. For the whole of Israel, all the families of Israel, and all the families of Israel had to be bringing their sacrifices. And there were three million of them. For 1,500 years. And how many sins did they wash away with the blood of bulls and goats and the lambs and the, and, and the, and, and the doves and all the, the, the billions of sacrifices with the blood flowing? How many sacrifices? How many sins were taken away? Offering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Nobody got saved by the law. That's why when you go to Hebrews 11, the heroes of faith. Now they lived in the period of the law. But it says by faith they got saved. Not by the works of the law. You see, they were living in the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant, which they, the covenant of Moses could never take away. It was the covenant of faith. Now notice what it says in verse 12. This man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice. Now they offered billions of sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever... 
sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till the enemies have made his footstool for by one offering, one offering, he has what? Perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Notice there's a past and a present there. He has perfected those who are being sanctified. There's a dual aspect here. And one of those is our legal status. You see, our legal status, that's already accomplished. Our legal status is that we are 100% clean, sinless, perfect. But our living reality is we're still sinners. We're still in the process of being sanctified. Now, looking at the work of the cross, our legal status is we're perfect. Hebrews 10, 14, he has perfected us. But our reality is that we're still growing in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us the Holy Spirit is working and changing us from glory to glory into the image of Christ by the power of the Spirit of God. See, we're growing daily. So the, the red line there, that's our status. Perfect. The reality is we came to the foot of the cross as sinners and we begin to walk in Christ and we are growing and we are being changed day by day. The process of restoration is taking place and we're looking for the day when our reality meets our legal status. Romans 10, 14 again, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Our legal status, perfect. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified. And what does justified mean? Well, putting it simply, it's just as if I'd never sinned. I've been totally declared righteous in God. See, that's the legal status. I'm justified. But the reality is I'm growing in Jesus. And this is, we don't just sit around in that waiting room that I was talking about yesterday at the airport, the heavenly airport. We grow in Christ. This is the challenge of the last days, to grow until we become to the measure of our measuring rod and we are like Christ. And that's our goal, to be like him. We sing that song, to be like Jesus. You know, there's a song that says that. We're being changed and transformed. The reality is we are being changed. 2 Corinthians 4.10 We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Ephesians 5.25-27 Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And here's his goal that he might present her, the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Galatians 4.19, My little children for whom I labour in birth again until Christ is formed in you. 1 John 1.7, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You know, if somebody's walking in darkness, I mean, the light that speaks about truth, talks about love, talks about openness, honesty. If we walk in the light, just as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship. If we walk in darkness and cover things up and we're not honest with each other, we're not going to have very good fellowship. That's why many marriages break down. Too many secrets from each other. No openness, no honesty, no true love. And no truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And look what that then releases. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. The word cleanses there is a progressive present that's going on and on and on. See, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, 
where we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, is cleansing and cleansing until we get to that last step where there's no more sin. We'll have been changed fully into the image and the likeness of Christ. And the great revival will come to pass. So you can see in these three steps here, walk in the light. Because of reconciliation through the cross, we can live in a beautiful relationship with Jesus. Have fellowship, our relationship healed and restored. The blood of Jesus Christ progressively sanctifying, cleansing, until we are 100% clean from all sin. So it's 1991 since the cross, 2021. 1,991 years of church history has gone. And we might have somewhere between 10 and 40 years to go. When I put 10 and 40, because I don't know the day or the hour, that's, that's in the Father's hand. But I can read the signs of the times. And I can also look at the roadmap that God's given to us and know that we've come right down to the very end. And he's got some amazing, fantastic, super fantastic things prepared for the church. If we can go back to the diagram that was right up at the top, that's where we are today, 2021. And it's getting very close to the end. I know there's lots of things we could talk about, about the Antichrist, the false prophet, the great red dragon. Uh, there's lots of things we can talk about, about the judgments that are going to come on the seven trumpets, the seven vials, the seven thunders, the seven vials, and, or seven seals. And some of those things can be pretty scary. But if we know what God's plan for the church is and that we are safe and secure in his hands, then a thousand might fall at your left, 10,000 at your right. But it's not going to come near you. Just like the children of Israel preserved in Goshen. The end is going to be fantastic. Don't worry about what's going to come in the future. Get your eyes upon Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit transform you and you will be an instrument in the hand of God and your years to come. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are, the years to come are going to be the best years of your life. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would impart into our spirits the vision that's in your heart. Lord, we know that there's many, many different theories and doctrines around. But Lord, we want to know what's in your heart. So help us, I pray, to understand and to fulfill the mission that you've given us. That we might see your glory filling the earth as the waters cover the sea. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to talk this morning about the church in the book of Revelation. I grew up in church from when I was tiny. And when I was 11 or 12 years old, I heard a lot of teaching on the end times. And uh, I learned that we were living in the last days, that God had a plan right from the beginning of the ages. And so as a young teenager, my life was given direction. I was living in the last days, last generation. Jesus was coming soon and I'd better get right with him, walk with him, live for him. And uh, so that became my direction. And I thank God for that uh, teaching when I was a young child that's, uh, that's been with me and a foundation for for me all my life. So I believe the eschatology and the message of the last days is vital for the church. I've had pastors say, well, you just have to get on with living. Jesus will come when he's ready. Don't worry about it. But for me, it becomes a powerful motivation. And I believe 
down through the ages that every generation has lived with the hope of the imminence of his coming. And that because we are waiting eagerly for his appearing. We are waiting for his coming. Today, uh, talking about the church in the book of Revelation, one thing I have frequently come across is people say the book of Revelation speaks about the church in Revelation 1 to 3 and then the church disappears and it's all about Israel. So all we have to do is wait for the rapture and we'll be taken out of here and then God will finish his program with the Jews. But no, I believe that we see the church the, the book of Revelation was written for the church. In Revelation 1 and 3, it says, Blessed is he that reads, hears, and keeps the words of this prophecy. Read it, <laughs> hear it, and keep it. There's a special blessing. So Revelation is highly important. Revelation talks about the last things. And if you look at the book of Revelation, it's very clear. Chapters 1 to 5 are about Christ and the church. The seven churches in chapters 1 to 3. And the heavenly church gathered to the Lamb in chapters 4 and 5. Chapter 6 and 7, the seals are opened and the sealing takes place of the 144,000. In chapters 8 and 9, then the seven trumpets blow and the judgments that have begun with the seven seals become stronger and stronger. In chapter 10, there's a revelation of Christ himself and he utters seven thunders, but they're sealed up. And we're not told what they are. And then in chapters 11 through to 14, you have the three and a half years or the 1,260 days or the 42 months, the time, times and half a time of the last rule of the Antichrist, the beast and the dragon and the false prophet. And that time is repeated again and again, about five times in the book of Revelation and another three or four times in the book of Daniel. So that was a period of the Great Tribulation. And that also includes the period of the seven vials or the seven bowls of wrath that are poured out in chapters 15. And that continues on into chapter 18 where you have the destruction of Babylon and the Battle of Armageddon. In chapter 19, the Lord returns. That's the coming to the end of time as just has been showing. And chapter 20, the millennium, and, and 20 to 22, the heavens and the new earth. So we have a clear, it's not exactly chronological because there's some overlapping, but you have very clear divisions in the book of Revelation, which tells us about the last thing. So where is the church in the book of Revelation? It's very clear in Revelation 1, Christ is seen in the midst of the seven candlesticks representing, we're told directly, the seven churches. So the message is to Christ. Christ is amongst the seven churches. These were the seven churches of Asia, which was today, Asia is Turkey. It's interesting, isn't it, today? Turkey is no longer a Christian nation, but it began there. In Turkey, these seven churches, Christ stands in the midst. And we, what is the message to the churches? To those seven churches, it's given a very clear message. And the message is repent. To the church in Ephesus, repent. To Sardis, to Smyrna, to Thyatira, to the whole seven. Repent, repent, repent. And so we've got to be always ready to hear the message of repentance. I remember in Indonesia, someone in one area, uh, a pastor from another church said, oh, we don't need to repent, we're already Christians. But we must never forget, hear the word, repent. 
turn because God has called us to go on to perfection. If we're not perfect, we need to repent. And then as Jeff talked about, John, the apostle, he hears a voice behind him and he turns and he sees a door opened in heaven and a voice says that he's going to show him what must take place after this. And what does he see? He sees the lamb in the midst of the throne, Revelation 4 to 5. And we see that all the elders who are around the throne, representing the leadership of the church, they all throw down their crowns. Ah, this is a leadership of a church where the, the leaders, the elders, the ministers, the worship leaders throw down their crowns because they live not for themselves but for the Lamb who sits on the throne. And then the cry comes, who's worthy to open the seals? Revelation 5. And then we see how the Lamb begins to open up the seals on the books. And the seals are opened in Revelation 6. And we know how uh, this first seal is open. The, red, the white horse goes forth. Then the red horse, the black horse, and this terrible horse. And then the... Uh, uh, great persecution comes and great earthquakes. These are the signs of his coming. We don't know yet whether we are seeing the fulfilled. Re we live in these days, but I think we're pretty close. We are seeing the gospel being preached in all the nations. The white horse and his rider, Christ and the uh, Christ sending forth the gospel into all the world. That has to happen before he comes again. We're seeing wars, and maybe we're going to see far greater wars. We're seeing famines and plagues and uh, viruses and earthquakes taking place. These seals are the pressures that God is allowing to bring the church to the place where he wants. And so I think COVID, God has allowed to impact the church so that we will prepare ourselves for his coming. And then the, and we see in the sixth seal how the heavens roll back as a scroll. So maybe this uh, is uh, the seals sort of flow through until the very last moment when the heavens are opened and Jesus comes. But we see that, uh, that in Revelation 7... Before the end, there is a sealing that takes place. The sealing of the 144,000. Now, 144,000 are sealed. Who are they? They're called the sealed ones. They are called the servants of our God. Who today are the servants of our God? Are you? In Indonesia, the ministers are called Hamba Tuhan, the servant of the Lord. And if you ask the Indonesian church, who here is a servant of the Lord? All the pastors will raise their hands and everyone else will not. But we are all the servants of the Lord. And what do you ask them? <laughs> when only the pastors put their hands up, I say, well, if they're the servants of the Lord, who are you servants of? <laughs> and then, of course, emphasizing that we are all the servants of the Lord. Yes. The servants of the Lord and only the servants of the Lord are sealed. And they are of the twi 12 tribes of Israel. But what is Israel? We know who the sealed ones are, because in Ephesians 1.13, it says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And why were we sealed? Ephesians 4.30 says, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And Jeff talked about this too. We are redeemed. <laughs> if I died tonight, I know I'd go to be with the Lord because I've been redeemed. 
but I am being redeemed. It's a process, changing from faith to faith, from glory to glory, going from strength to strength, being transformed into his image. But we are sealed unto the day of redemption. The day hasn't come yet. <laughs> We're waiting for the day of redemption. So the time will come when the seal of redemption is put on the children of Israel. Who are the children of Israel? Who is the Israel of God? Galatians 6.16 says, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. In Philippians 3, 3, it says, we are the circumcision. Who are the circumcision? The Israel of God. Who? We which re worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Is that us? <laughs> are we, in Ephesians 2, the one new man? Formerly, we were estranged. We were enemies of God. And they were enemies of the commonwealth of Israel. But now we've been born. We've become one new man through the cross. So we are the Israel of God. So there's a sealing time coming for those who are ready. And then we see in Revelation 8 and 9, the trumpets blow. The sealed ones are protected. 144,000 are protected in this time. Everyone else suffers greatly as the judgments of God increase on the earth. In chapter 10, the angel utters his voice and seven thunders go forth. And then we come to Revelation 11, which Jeff talked about earlier, at the time of the measuring. As we read before, there was given a reed like a rod and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Something about worshipping God that makes us those who are sealed and those who measure up. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city. They shall tread underfoot. Forty and two months. So here we have the beginning of the great tribulation. The three and a half years. The 42 months. When there is a treading down of those in the outer court. These are people who come to worship God. They're not the sinners and the Gentiles. But they are trodden down. But. The, those who are in the temple, in the most holy place, and those who are at the altar, the altar of incense, and those who worship, they're measured. So what's being measured? It's the church. And who does the measuring? God himself. And that's why in Ephesians 4 it says we m must measure up to the fullness of Christ. Nothing less. Don't say I'm just a normal human being. I can't help it. I sin. Everybody sins. Yeah, that's the way it is. No, we are called by God to holiness. We are called to be like Jesus. We are called to be conformed to his image. That becomes our motivation. We live for Jesus. We want to be like him. And then in Revelation 11, we see the two witnesses. Why do the two witnesses come? They come to confirm the covenant for three and a half years. They come to confirm the covenant for half a week, 42 months, 1,260 days, time, times and a half a time. They confirm the covenant of God's judgment. Jesus came for three and a half years and he confirmed the covenant that was given to Abraham. He confirmed God's covenant of mercy and grace. And for 2,000 years we've had an opportunity to respond to that covenant. But that covenant 
of judgment will also be confirmed. God is a God of mercy and compassion, of love. He's not willing for anything, anyone to perish. But he is also a God of judgment and holiness and righteousness. And so he will confirm who he is. He will confirm his word. He will confirm all that he has said in the volume of the book, the Bible. And then we see in Revelation eleven nineteen, the temple of God's opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, the very place where he dwells. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. There's going to come an opening of the heavens. And it's after that we read Revelation 12, where the woman gives birth. Jeff talked about this also. So who is that woman who gives birth? Some people say it's Israel. Some people say it was Mary. But we see that this event occurs after war in heaven. There's a spiritual warfare going on that we don't know about that's taking place in the heavenlies. And we see in that warfare that the great red dragon is going to be cast out of heaven. Satan still has power. He accuses us day and night. He oppresses us. He is our enemy. We don't have human enemies, but we have one enemy. And he's out to destroy us. And he'll come and whisper in our ears. And he'll cause us to face depression. And he'll cause us to feel condemned. Or he'll cause us to make light of sin and think that we, uh, we can do whatever we like and God will still forgive us. But he's coming as a serpent. And Revelation 12, 9 says, The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent identifies him with Genesis chapter 3 called the devil the adversary the opposition the accuser and Satan the accuser which deceiveth which deceives the whole world and I have never in my life seen such deception it horrifies me the deception that has come upon the whole world. A baby is born. The first question, is it a boy or a girl? The basic, the basic nature of every man and woman on earth is that they are a man or woman. They are a boy or a girl. But the world's deceived. How, if they can be deceived by that... <laughs> What else are they going to be deceived by? But the great dragon, <laughs> that old deceiver, he's going to be cast out into the earth and his angels are going to be cast out with him. Therefore, it says in Revelation 12, Rejoice, O heavens, and all you who dwell in her, woe to you on earth and the sea. So let's live in heavenly places. <laughs> if we're born again children of God, we are raised up with Christ to live in heavenly places. And for us, a time of great rejoicing is near at hand because our enemy is going to be destroyed. But for those who reject Christ, it's woe because Satan is going to come down. And this is what the scriptures say. Rejoice, O oh heavens, but woe to you who reject him. The great and glorious day of the Lord is coming. Great and glorious for those who believe in him. This is what we want to see. But terrible, a terrible day for those who reject him. And we see after the woman... Uh, the, 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 after the woman is taken out, then the dragon sends out a flood to destroy her. He tries, but he can no longer touch her. That's a great day when Satan can no longer touch us. 
And we see at that time the church is taken out of the way. The church is taken out into the wilderness. This is in Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God and that they would feed her there 1,203 score 60 days. 1,260 days. It's very clear how long it'll be. The woman flees. She runs. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, flee. So there's a time when the church must flee. But look at Revelation 12, 14. It said, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly. <laughs> so don't worry about fleeing. Fly. <laughs> fleeing or flying. <laughs> She was given that, the wings that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, prepared of God, where she is nourished, fed, looked after for a time and times and half a time. A year and years and a half a year. This is the exact same terminology used in the book of Daniel which is the same as 1,260 days or 42 months. She will be protected from the face of the servant. So flying or fleeing, we're going to go out on eagle's wings. We don't know how it's going to happen. <laughs> and Jesus said, if you hear he's in the wilderness, don't go out there. <laughs> and if you hear he's in the secret place, don't go there. <laughs> For as lightning he's come, and it says we'll be gathered together. <laughs> the eagles gathered to the body. So it is only then, after the woman has been taken out or has fled, off, that the wicked one will be revealed. And that's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you. It's a time of great deception. And we're told one thing, let no man deceive you by any means. For they can, <laughs> there's so many stories you can read on the internet. Jesus is coming tomorrow and we'll look at all these prophecies. And, but let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except two things happen. There come a Falling away first. The Greek word is apostasia or apostasy. Don't be deceived. Before that day, and uh, Paul has said that's the day of his appearing, the day of our gathering together to him, the day of the Lord, that day will not come before there comes an apostasy. Great falling man away. The man of sin will be revealed, the Antichrist, the son of perdition. So that has to happen before Jesus comes again. And what will he do? It says he will sit as God. He will appear as God. 2 Thessalonians 2 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself as God. That is the abomination of desolation. That is the manifestation, the apocalypse of the man of sin. But before that day, the church, God's people must be taken out of the way but before that there's going to be a great apostasy we have a choice to be in the great apostasy or to be in the great taking away measuring up to the fullness of Christ or being trodden underfoot that's what we're facing in these days and then we see in Revelation 13 the beast rises from the sea the antichrist rules he's given a 
in Revelation 13, 5, he's given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. 12, 60 days, three and a half years. He's given power in Revelation 37. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given over to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. I never thought that <laughs> this sort of thing could happen. But we're seeing signs how easily that would happen today. Revelation 13 verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The whole world will submit, except those who are willing to die, like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, like Daniel, who are willing to stand up because their names are written in the book of life. So Satan comes, and, and again in Second Thessalonians it says, he comes after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and in verse 10, and with all the seevilness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. How important it is to love the truth. No compromise. Love his word. Love the truth and hate the lie. And so Satan comes at the time of great tribulation. But in Revelation 14, the Lamb stands with the 144,000 on the Mount of Zion. We have been called to Mount Zion. Not to Sinai, but we've been called to, to Zion. So who stands on Mount Zion? Jeff talked about this uh, yesterday too. Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. That's where we want to stand. And so the angel goes forth, preaches the gospel during the great tribulation. The harvest of the wicked comes as the angels come with their sickles and the blood is poured out. And the seven, the seven angels with the bowls of wrath pour them out. And so you see it. In the great tribulation, at, towards the end of that last three and a half years, there's a pouring out of God's wrath upon the earth, but they still won't repent. The ones who left, even though they see the judgments of God, will not repent. But in Revelation, that we see that, that on Mount Zion, there are those who sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. The Old and New Testaments. <laughs> not just the song of Moses. But the whole word of God, the full revelation of himself. And so the seven bowls of wrath are poured out. The battle of Armageddon takes place in the valley of Megiddo. Babylon is destroyed. And then the Lord comes in Revelation 19. He comes in all his power and glory, at the end of the three and a half years, to pour out his wrath on the kingdom of the Antichrist. And at that time, there's no one left alive on earth, apart from all the wicked, and the church protected in the wilderness. And then, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 says, And then that wicked shall be revealed. The apocalypse of the of wicked one whom the Lord shall consume three and a half years after he's given all power to do his worst, then the Lord shall consume him with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy him with the brightness of his coming. And as he comes, it's a time for the marriage of the Lamb. In Revelation 19 Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. <laughs> are we ready? Who is the bride? Ephesians 5 tells us we are married to Christ. He is our bridegroom. 
And then the armies come with, as Jesus comes to destroy the Antichrist, it says in Revelation 19.40, and the armies which were with him in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We are the army of the Lord. Who's the army of God? Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that we can withstand in that day. So that we can stand against our enemy. And then after that is the millennium. Who rules with Christ in the millennium? The overcomers. All the ones who died in the great tribulation. And all those who were ready and perfected before that time. Those who come out of that great tribulation. They will rule and reign with him. The new heavens and the new Jerusalem comes down. And who is the new Jerusalem? We have been called, we are uh, uh, the new Jerusalem that God is building. So the time is near. The time is near. The final invitation, the spirit and the bride say, come. And then, so we are part of that bride, giving that invitation to the world. Come, come, while this time and then the final promise in the word of God. Yes, I come quickly. And the final prayer. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And so this is our hope. This is our goal. We want to be with Jesus. We want to meet him. He's coming soon. This is great news. We want to be ready. We just want to be with him. We love him. And our whole desire is to be with him forever and ever. And the time is coming. Meanwhile, we're together with one another. And we gather to the Lamb. Two or three gathered in his name. He's here with us in the midst, preparing us for the day of his coming.